welcome. However you find yourself here today, I'm very glad, I'm very thankful. Uh, and so the word that God has put on my heart today uh, is something that I call vision over sight or sight under vision. Uh, kind of following the same principle of just as over because. And uh, God has already put more word in my heart and more message in my heart uh, for a few more weeks. So I think I'm going to stay on something around the same topic or the same style as something over something for the next few weeks. So uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying uh, this little, I guess you could call it, sermon series that uh, God has put in my heart. Um, but today I will be reading from Acts 9, verses 1 through 19. Uh, but before I get deep into that, I'm going to share. So while you guys are locating that passage, um, I'm going to share a little bit about the story behind these little babies right here. Uh, my glasses and why I need them. Uh, usually I don't wear glasses, but I thought that it would be uh, nice for this message. I think it would uh, visually represent some of the stuff that I'm about to uh, share with you guys. Uh, but if I'm not wearing my glasses, I'm wearing contacts. Uh, so I'm always having something that helps correct my vision. But uh, when I first realized that I needed con or contacts or glasses, whenever I realized that I needed something uh, to help my vision, I was a sophomore in high school, and I was in band class. And yes, I know, band, I was a nerd. Okay, I get it. But uh, I love band. I'm actually still in the drum line here. Uh, but in high school, in order to be in the drum line, you had to be in a classroom band as well. So that's why I had to be in band class itself. Uh, so I was in band class, and uh, usually I would read the instructions that our teacher put up on the board before I went back to uh, the percussion section, which is in the back of the room. And so there was one day where our teacher wrote something on the board, and I noticed that I couldn't see it. So I kind of walked up to the... Uh, front of the classroom and read it and then walked back. Didn't think much about it, but then it happened again. Now, the first time when this happened, we were doing individual warm-ups, so it wasn't that bad. We weren't doing anything as a unit yet, but the next time that my teacher did it, she did it while we were warming up as a unit. She uh, conducted us and let us begin uh, what we were going to be warming up with, but then she stopped conducting, had us continue on, and then wrote up on the board what we were doing. So I turned to one of my friends beside me, and I was like, man, don't you hate it when she does that? And he's like, does what? What are you talking about? And I'm like, when she writes the instructions on the board after we're already in class, because we can't see them from back here. It's not like you can make out what's on the board. And he's like, uh, what, what do you mean you can't see what's on the board? you should be able to see what's on the board. And I was just like, oh, really? Okay, then. So I had my mom take me to the optometrist or opt optologist, I don't know, the eye doctor. I had my mom take me to the eye doctor. You guys probably know what it's called. Nobody cares. Um, so I went to the eye doctor, and you know that there's that machine, if any of you guys have ever been before, there's that machine that has like two little goggle holes, essentially, and then she'll like flip through, and she'll be like, okay, uh, does picture one or picture two look cleaner? And then you have to tell her like which one looks clearer and which one is less blurry or whatever. But uh, so after we had done this for like five or ten minutes, we get to the last picture, right, the last set of pictures, and she goes, okay, is, verse, or is picture one clearer? And when I looked at the first picture, I realized that I could hardly make out what was on the page. Everything was so blurry. The letters that were there seemed to flow together, and they were all overlapping. And if I wanted to be able to understand what was there, it would have taken me a long time to be able to get probably half of the letters. It's not something that I could just see and be able to answer. And then... She said, what about picture two? And so when she flipped the picture two, it was like, hands down, so much clearer than picture one was. And so I was like, oh, without a doubt, picture two. She's like, really? That's interesting. 
because vision one is your natural sight. I actually removed all of the filters from the uh, like machine, and vision one is your natural sight. And she said vision two is what you would or what you would look like, what you would be seeing with glasses. So in that moment, I realized I had been missing so much about the world around me. I hadn't been tested for sight or for vision in like four or five years. So I just never thought that my vision would degrade. I thought that it stayed 2020, like the last time, last time I got tested. So I didn't think about it. But when she showed me that I couldn't see, and once I got a taste of what seeing that was, I couldn't even imagine what I was going to be able to see. So a few weeks later, we went back in to the eye doctor, and we were sitting down. She was about to hand me my glasses. Now, the doctor was sitting with her back uh, facing a window. So she was sitting away from the window, and this window looked out across the street and uh, over to some more buildings and whatnot that were on the other side. So I get the glasses, and I put them on, and the first thing I say, and probably the first thing that a lot of people said when they first saw outside with their glasses, they were like, leaves! <coughs> Excuse me. I was able to see the leaves on the tree from all the way over on the other side of the road. And now for you guys who don't need glasses, you probably can't have that same understanding where it's like, we thought, the people, like, we who need glasses, we just thought that from that far away, it was supposed to look like a green blob. We didn't know that you were supposed to be able to see all the individual leaves on the tree. But when I put that on, it made sense. Because at this point, I already had my driver's permit, and I've been driving for a few months, and my, both of my parents complained that I was a very choppy driver. And I was most likely choppy because uh, when they told me to go and turn onto a road that I didn't know, uh, I would have to get up really close to it before I could see it. So in order for me to be able to make the turn without missing the road, is I would have to slam on the brakes and turn. So it's not that I was a bad driver, and then if you guys end up riding with me, like, I'm not a bad driver. It's just I couldn't see. So just make sure that I'm wearing my contacts or my glasses when I'm driving you places. I just couldn't see what was around me. And so then, like, my driving got better and whatnot, whatever. I was able to see, uh, so that probably helped. But when I put on the glasses, I was able to step out of not being able to make out the things that were around me. And now, once I got this vision, I was able to understand it. So I want to address how I'm going to be referring to sight and vision throughout this message today uh, to hopefully have you get a little bit of an understanding about what I'm talking about. Uh, so sight, the way I'm going to be referring to it today, sight has humanly explanation, right? Vision has divine implication. So if you don't like the way that that works, I have another uh, interpretation for you. Sight is what you use to see what is around you. Vision is the way that you interpret what is around you. Okay? So if we go through life with our sight, then we'll just be able to see what's around us. But if we go through life with a vision, we'll be able to understand and explain what is around us. We'll be able to have a better interpretation and a deeper meaning behind what is around us. So I'm going to start reading in Acts chapter 9. I'm going to read verses 1 through 19, but I'm not going to stop at like every single verse. I'll make it so that it's not that long. I know. I got it. I got it. I got it. I know 19 verses is long, but I think that they're all important, so I'm going to read them all. 
So, Saul, this, excuse me, this right here is looking at a man named Saul and Saul's conversion in his life. So, Acts 9 starts by saying, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, the way meaning belonging to Christ, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So Saul was a man who uh, was not doing too good things and who was not in the favor of God. He wasn't doing too many things that pleased God at the time. So verse 3 says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And now the, the way that Saul responds here is one of the funniest responses I think that there is in the Bible. Verse 5 says, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. It's like, who are you? What in the world do you think you're doing? It's like, who are you that comes down and sends this light that overwhelms and throws me to the floor? Who are you? But then after that, he's like, who are you, Lord? <laughs> he had no clue. He had spent his life up to this point persecuting those who followed God, persecuting those who followed the Lord. But now that he's been exposed to it, he's able to understand that it's him even without that exposure. And he might still be questioning it. But he's not just going to throw it up. He didn't say, who are you, the devil? No, he said, who are you, Lord? Lord? He knew it was God, even though he had not been exposed to him yet. That's pretty crazy. So, verse 5 continues to say, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. That's pretty commanding for somebody who has never been exposed to God before and who, in fact, has been persecuting those who follow God. God says, do what I tell you. Verse 7 says, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. So here, when God has implanted this overwhelming light into Saul's life, when God has implanted this into Saul, then the people who were around him didn't see what God did. They could only hear what God was saying. They heard, but they did not see. And when God calls a vision into your life, when God calls you, people around you might be able to hear it, but they won't be able to see it. They aren't exposed to it in the same way you are. So when you start moving by vision instead of moving by sight, they won't understand it because they haven't seen the God that you have been exposed to. They've only heard the God that you've been exposed to. They've heard it with one of the senses, but you've got two senses under your belt. You have the hearing and the seeing. So you are able to understand at a better level what God is trying to do in your life once You've seen him in this way. But these men who were with him, it says in verse 8 that Paul opened his eyes, but when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see. And so I can imagine that when Saul was on the ground and he realized that he couldn't see, he got up 
and he started feeling around. He tried to make sense out of the place that he was because he couldn't see it. So he had to feel around to try and understand what was around him. It, but the people who were with him thought that he was okay because his eyes were open. But let me tell you something. Just because somebody's eyes are open doesn't mean that they're understanding what's around them. It doesn't mean that they're able to comprehend what's happening. Just because their eyes are open doesn't mean that they're seeing it. That's exactly what happened with Paul. These people had to help him and get him into Damascus because he couldn't do it by himself. Verse 9 says, For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. Paul, or Saul, he's not Paul yet, Saul, realized once he had been <coughs> excuse me, sorry, you know, allergies, running around, I'm not feeling too odd, but I'm still doing this anyway because God has implanted a vision in my life. So I'm doing, no matter what the devil tries to stop me with, with feeling bad about myself, with feeling sick about myself, I know that there's a vision that God has called into my life, and so I'm not going to let a little cough hold me back. But if I do cough a few times, I'm sorry. I tried to drink some water before I came here to speak, so <laughs> hopefully it's not too bad. Uh, but anyways, let's see, where was I? Right, so he was blind and weak. He said, the verse says that he was blind and did not eat or drink for three days. Now, if you've watched some of my other messages, we looked at a little bit this, this meaning behind the number three and how three would be final in this time period. So Saul, once being exposed to his blindness and to his weakness for three days, he thought that that was the way it was going to be forever. Because three has a finality to it. But also, what's important to know is that there's been studies looking at the consumption of food and water that show if you don't drink for three days, if you're not dead already, you'll be dead soon. So Saul was on the brink of death. He, once being exposed to God, was weak and blind without him. And Saul realized this. And if you can't eat, if you can't drink, if you can't see, if you cannot function, if you are blind and weak without God, what's the only thing that you can do? The only thing that you can do is come to God in prayer. And that's truly what I think Saul did. But God didn't show himself up in the way that he did before. He didn't, he didn't come back with an overwhelming light that threw Saul to the ground. Let's continue reading on a little bit. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord. He answered, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. It's the only thing he can do. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So God, once you realize that you're blind and that you're weak without God, God will implant just a little bit of the vision in your life. Paul gets a little glimpse of his future. And that's what God will do with you. God will give you a little glimpse of your future, but he'll allow you to live in your present. Just because Saul got this feeling 
that God put in him, that God had him see that Ananias was going to come over, touch him, and restore his sight. Excuse me. Even though Paul had seen this, hadn't happened yet. Hadn't happened. God will give you a little taste of it, but he won't let you live it until it's time. So verse 13 says, Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias is like, are you sure? You sure that Saul is the man who you're talking about? You sure you didn't get the name wrong? You sure you didn't get the city wrong? I mean, it can't be Saul from Tarsus because Saul from Tarsus is not a man of God. Saul from Tarsus is a man who persecutes you, God. Are you sure? You sure that he's the one praying? Are you sure that I'm the one who has to go to him in this vision? Verse 15 says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go! He said, Go! God, after you've given him all the excuses in the book, once you've pointed out to God what God already knows, God says, I don't care what is holding you back. All that I'm telling you to do is to go. In verse 11, remember it said, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. So when God tells you to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, you're going to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. God doesn't care who's in the house. God doesn't care that there's somebody who has been persecuting this people. God has already taken care of that. We know what's happened to Saul before this. Ananias doesn't know what's happened to Saul, but we know what's happened to Saul. God has called Ananias. And after he's given all the excuses in the book, God just simply says, go. Verse 15 continues to say, go. This man, I love this wording here, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings. Now this is important because when we look at the Gentiles and the Israelites, Ananias was an uh, Israelite. He was of Jewish descent. But Saul was not. So these people, the Jewish people, did not talk, did not want to converse with the Gentiles. So if God says, you know what? If you, as a people that I've called, are not going to reach everyone who I've called you to reach, then guess what? I'll take somebody who has been persecuting me and who has been persecuting my name and been persecuting my people, and I will make it so that he will talk to the people who you haven't. But not only that. It doesn't just say that he'll carry the name before the Gentiles. Verse 15 continues to say, and before the people of Israel. Saul, later known as Paul, and I'm sure that if you've been in church for even a little while, you've heard of the name Paul thrown around. Paul is one of the most influential people in the Bible. Even today, he's one of the most influential people in the Christian religion. Paul did not only speak to the people that the Jewish people denied, Paul spoke to the Jewish people. The Jewish people who were called by God did not associate themselves, did not put themselves in line with the Gentiles, but God said, guess what, if you're not going to do it, somebody else will, and guess what, I'll make it so that he not only brings up the Gentiles, but so that he brings up the Jewish too, and so that he unites you under my music. He's the chosen instrument, and God's music 
is something that brings people together, not brings people apart. So if you've been exposed to God's word that draws us apart from other people, that makes us feel like the Jewish people despising the Gentiles, then you have not heard the word of God. I'm just going to say it straight up. You have not been exposed to who God is if for your whole entire life you have been looking at it that somebody like Saul, somebody who has killed thousands of Christians, somebody who is persecuted and isolated and thrown in jail, the people who follow Christ, if you can look at this man and say, nothing good can ever come of him, then you have not been exposed to the word of God. Because if you know the word of God, God doesn't use perfect people. God uses imperfect people for his plan. God needs somebody who has been in the places where we never want to go in order to do his work. So whether you are that person that you think that God can never use you because of what you've done, I guarantee that you have not killed thousands upon thousands of Christians. God doesn't use perfect people. God uses Saul to become the most influential person, arguably, in the Bible. The person who is doing the most harm to God, God then said, let me take your passion for something that is against me. And if we can find a way to use your passion for something that glorifies me, oh man, watch out. Because not only will you raise up the Gentiles, but you'll take the Jews and you'll bring them together. And if you've been dealing or exposed to Christianity that talks about the split, that's not the word of God. That is not what God is called. Because he's not only there to talk to the Gentiles and their kings, but he's also there to talk to the people of Israel. I will show him, verse 16, I will show him how much... He must suffer for my name. God. Now this is a little bit weird, this wording, this suffering, but when you look at what Paul would eventually go through, not what Saul would eventually go through, because God ended up claiming Saul and renaming him into something that God saw. God named him for his Potential, he named him for what God saw in him. God named it not for what people saw, because people saw Saul. But God saw Paul. And the people that we see as Saul, we don't have the vision to see them as Paul. We just have the sight to see them as they are. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hand on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So once you have come to a point where you realize that you're blind, that you realize that you cannot see, that you realize that you are weak without God, then, after he's given you a little bit of taste of what he's going to put into your future, then God says, here he is. This is the man. This is the time for you to be able to see what I'm doing in your life. But I guarantee that when Saul came to God in prayer, he was not expecting somebody else at first to come and restore his vision. When Saul was praying to God, it doesn't say when this vision came. So this vision, this little tiny glimpse of what God was going to do, could have came at any point during the three days. And maybe it came really early. 
And then he was left for three days without anything. Or maybe he had been waiting two and a half days for this vision to come, and then God finally gave it to him. But one thing that I think Saul felt was that God had forgotten about him. But God hadn't forgot about him. God allowed him to stay in his present, even though he got a taste of the future, because if you don't live through the present, then you can't make it to the future. God is working on getting Ananias over here. Is He's working on getting Ananias into your life. But it takes time. Ananias didn't want to go. Ananias, man, it says that God came to Ananias in a vision, and then God told him what to do, and then Ananias responded back, was like, are you sure? And then God said, well, go, and maybe it took him a few days to gain up the strength. We don't know. We don't know how this all played out. We just know that it happened over the course of three days. But when he finally showed up, he said, I'm here to restore your vision and give you the Holy Spirit. I'm here to not only restore your vision, but to fill you with the Holy Spirit. So if you want another way of thinking about sight and vision, sight is what you, as a human, by yourself, can see. Vision is filling you with the Holy Spirit so that you can see what the Holy Spirit sees. With sight, you can only see what you see, but with vision, you can see what the Holy Spirit sees. So, when I read this in the King James Version, this is the stopping point. Verse 17 is the stopping point of Saul's conversion. And then it breaks off into a new section called Saul's Baptism for verse 18. And so I, I contemplated it and I thought about it. And I said, well, why would they stop at verse 17? Because in verse 17, nothing has happened to make Saul see. Ananias simply just said, I am here to restore your sight. It hasn't happened yet. But, but like, let me... Let me uh, let me tell this to you. The reason why the KJV split it up at verse 17 and made the baptism verse 18 is because when, when Ananias touched Saul, when Ananias was restored with his vision, he was baptized in that moment by God. When God gives you the vision, He renews everything for you. So verse 18 continues to say, Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. Then he got up and was baptized. So this is important. Once Saul had regained his vision, once, and uh, I, I cannot stand this description. It makes me cringe. and ugh, Every time I read it, it says, scales fell from his eyes. That's just like something out of a horror film. That's oh, utterly disgusting. But, once they fell from his eyes, once he got the vision, then he was baptized. Then he made the decision. You have to get the vision before you make the decision. Because what God calls in your life, you don't know the full implication of. You don't know completely what it is until God has restored and God has restored your vision in your life. God has not implanted it in you yet, so you can't make the decisions about what you're going to do in your future while living in your blind present. You can't rush what God is trying to do in your life. Verse 19. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Once God gave him the vision, God was not only able to restore his sight, but he was able to restore his strength. God not only restored the things that were around him, but he restored what was inside of him. 
but it took Saul in a place for three days where he knew that he could do nothing without God, that he was so weak and so blind without God, that it took him being in that place for him to understand that God is the only one who can bring back your vision and bring back your strength. He's the only one. So I want to share with you guys a, a story about an experience that I've had in college. Uh, in college, I take cycling classes uh, twice a week. Well, they happen twice a week. I try to go twice a week as many times as I can. Um, but our instructor is a Paralympic athlete. He actually missed the Rio Olympic uh, team by four seconds, and he's blind. So he often goes through during our class and explains to us some of the journey about how he got to where he is now. So there was one day when he said, uh, and he shared with us, that during the first year of his training, he got very frustrated because he wasn't seeing the results that he wanted. And so he looked to a mentor, uh, another Paralympic athlete who had won three medals in cycling. And so he looked to this mentor and said, what do I have to do in order for me to be able to see the results I want? And what this man said back was one of the most profound things that I think anybody has ever said. He said, why are you so worried about seeing when you have a vision? Because if you're only able to see the spot where you're at now, then you aren't going to be able to see the vision that God has called you to be in. You can either see through sight and you can see what is now around you, or you can see through vision and interpret what is around you. And this man also said to my instructor, he said, who needs sight when you have vision? You don't need to live by sight when you can live by vision. Another thing that comes to my mind, and this might date my interests a little bit, but another thing that comes to my mind when I think of sight and vision is I think of magic eye. And now if any of you guys don't know what magic eye is, it was something that was popular a very long time ago, and uh, it's something, it's like an optical illusion, where if you were to just look at it with normal sight, then you would see that it's a page filled with random pattern and random, like, pictures and colors on the page and it doesn't mean anything there's no meaning behind it but then when you learn how to look at it with the right vision then you can see what was not there with sight it was on the page the whole entire time you just couldn't see it when you looked at it with regular sight you had to look at it with a specific vision in order for you to be able to understand what is around you God and what God will do is once he restores your sight, once he restores your vision, because vision is just sight with the Holy Spirit, once you're able to see what the Holy Spirit sees, and you're able to take in what the Holy Spirit has around you, you won't worry about the things that you could see. You aren't worried about the things that you can see anymore because you're worried about the way that you can use what's around you. God says that he will prepare a table. <coughs> Excuse me. God says that he will prepare a table in front of you in the midst of your enemies. And what God is saying is the vision will allow you to see what was in front of you the whole time that you couldn't see before. God says, I'm going to give you the vision because who needs sight? Who needs to be able to see what is around them? Because what you were only able to see before is all the things that would hold you back, that were against you. But if you look right in front of you, it's been here the whole time. There's a plate. There's a table. There's food. And eat it in the midst of your enemies. God, when he gives you a vision... 
you'll never want to go back to sight. Once God has instored this vision into you, you'll never want to see it by regular sight again. Because God prepares that table in the midst of your enemies. God allows you to see what's around you that you couldn't see before, even though it was right in front of you. You just didn't have the knowledge and the interpretation and the way to look at it like you are now. You don't want to just see your enemies anymore. You want to see the table that God has put in front of you. And let me tell you something. Eat it up. The food that's on the table, eat it up. Eat up God's word. Eat up God's praise. Eat up your glory to God in the midst of your enemies. Because a lot of the times, it's the things that you don't want to associate yourself with, the people that you don't want to associate yourself with, the things that you don't want to do or the people that you don't want to talk to that God needs you to reach the most. So you may view them as your enemies, but God says, eat my word. And they will see my vision in your life. So that's why it's so important to see with vision instead of sight. Because if you go through life without wearing, without being exposed to the thing that allows you to get yourself out of your situation and put yourself in a glorification, then you won't be able understand what is around you. You can just make it out. But God doesn't make it out. He helps you make it up. God will not only allow you to see what's around you, but he will give you the meaning behind it. Once you put on those glasses, you'll never want to walk out without your Holy Spirit glasses again. Once God has given you that vision, you don't want to try and make it out because God says, I've given you a vision and now you can understand what is around you. You might see enemies, but I see success. You might see pain, but I see praise. So this is my message for this week. I hope that vision over sight was able to affect you or was able to allow your eyes to be open, no pun intended, in a way that you never had before. And I do want to offer this time, if you've been going through life, living by your sight instead of by God's vision, I want you, uh, if you've never come to God before, it's been a very long time before you've come, or since you've come to God. And I would like to offer this time for you now. So if you bow your head and pray with me. God, I know that I've been living by my sight, not by your vision. But God, I want that to change. God, I know that I'm blind. God, I know that I'm weak. And God, I know that you're the only person who can restore that into my life. God, I know that Jesus died on the cross, bearing the weight of my sin, and that he descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose out of hell and went to heaven but there were no sins with him, showing that he had already paid the price for my sins. God, don't allow me to continue walking around, living by my sight. God, make me aware of my blindness and my weakness so that you can instore and that you can restore a vision into my life. God, I don't 
God, I humble myself before you now. In the holy name we pray. Amen. If you just prayed that, I would love to hear from you. My email is pastormitchs at gmail.com. Uh, and you can shoot me an email. You can leave a comment down below. Um, but I would love to hear from you. I would love to help you take some next steps in your walk in Christ. So, like I said, the, the message that God has put into my week, or put into my life for next week, is uh, something that's probably going to follow the same lines of just as over because or vision over sight. Uh, I might make a little sermon series out of it, maybe three or four weeks. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. We'll see what God is trying to say and speak through me. Um, but I hope to see you back. The vision that God has put into my life for next week is something that I can't wait to share with you guys about. Uh, so I hope to see you then, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.